Uh oh. We'll start with this, what is our continued coverage of this past weekend's action on the undercard of what was the Matchroom Show, unbeaten up and comer from Brazil, Beatriz Ferreira took on seasoned Argentinian veteran, a tough fighter, very tough, very tall too, Yanina Lascano. For what was the newly vacated IBF title at 135 pounds, Katie Taylor's old title, it was up for grabs, and Beatriz Ferreira grabbed it, grabbed it with both hands, as I predicted, as I expected. She got off to a rocky start with Yanina Lescano because Yanina is an unusually tall fighter for 135 pounds. There are not a lot of 135 pounders as tall, no. as long, no. as rangy as Yanina Lescano, let alone as durable. What you saw at the start is that Beatrice was getting touched up on her way inside, trying to get within striking distance of Yanina Lescano past those long arms. Some shots got in on her way in and on her way out as she would try to make her exit. She was pulling back in straight lines, and Yanina, being as tall and as long as she is, she was able to catch her on her way out with straight punches, but that was just at the start. Things started taking a turn for the worst in the second round. Down, down, you saw the down. shift, as it was a very awkward assignment for a short, stumpy fighter like Beatrice Ferreira to take on somebody so much taller and longer than she is, she had to adjust, and by the second round, she made her adjustment. Bending at the waist, bending at the knees, inching forward within striking distance of Yanina, landing punches upstairs, punches downstairs, showing great creativity with her offense, getting mid-range to inside on Yanina Lescano, which is what I figured she would do. She's the stronger puncher of the two. You could see the body shots almost immediately were having an effect on Yanina Lescano, as well as the straight right hand over the top. Several right hands. Straight right hands, counter right hands that sent the very statuesque Yanina Lescano careening into the ropes, seemingly stopping her in her tracks and pushing her back. There's a lot of power. Beatrice has a lot of power. Piling on the damage, round after round, each round more punishing and worse than the last. For Yanina. And I've seen a lot of Yanina's fights, but I've never seen her take that much punishment. It's the worst shape that I've ever seen her in. To make matters worse, there was an accidental clash of heads that opened up a really bad cut above Yanina's eye. It was all bad. One way traffic after a while after Yanina found herself on the business end of Beatrice Ferreira's fists and her legs were clearly gone. She's just getting hit. She's taking too much punishment. Trying her best not to lose her footing. Trying her best to hang on and hang tough. The speed, the power, the aggression of Beatrice Ferreira proved too much for Argentina's own Yanina Lescano, which is really saying something because context is key. Yeah. Before yesterday, Yanina Lescano had never been stopped before. That's one. In 17 professional contests, Yanina Lescano had never been stopped. And she's been in there with some punchers like Mayra Moneo, who didn't stop her, Carolyn Dubois, who didn't stop her. Beatrice did. So for context, you're talking about a fighter who has a lot more pro experience than Beatrice and is a lot bigger and has never been stopped. That's one. Two, Beatrice Ferreira going into this fight only had four professional fights. She hasn't been a pro that long and she doesn't have that many fights, but she still stopped Yanina. That's two. Three, Beatrice Ferreira hasn't even been campaigning as a lightweight. Yeah, this weekend's fight was a lightweight contest, but Beatrice's first four fights we're downstairs at Super Featherweight. She moved up in weight for this fight. For the opportunity to fight for the newly vacated IBF title, for the opportunity to become a champion in just five professional fights, 
That's why she moved up. But understand, what? she moved up in weight to take on a fighter who's a lot bigger than she is with more pro experience who's never been stopped. And she stopped her where Mayra Moneo couldn't stop her, Carolyn Dubois couldn't stop her, Beatrice did. I mean, Carolyn looked great with Yanina Lescano, but this, this... This was a demolition job. I've never seen Yanina Lascano in such bad shape. I've never seen her take that much punishment and be that hurt, that banged up. This is one of the most durable fighters anywhere at or around this weight. Beatrice made a statement yesterday and sent a message to anybody and everybody at or around these weights. Established names or otherwise, she is a near and apparent credible threat to anybody anywhere in between 130, 135, and 140. She made a splash yesterday. She left a lasting impression. And became IBF lightweight champion. She has plans to return to the amateurs in the immediate future to try to win the gold in the next Olympics. I was mistaken before. I thought she won the gold before. She won the silver. Now she's going back for the gold. But when she comes back... She's everybody's problem. And I don't imagine there's gonna be anybody that's in a hurry to fight Beatrice. She's a fucking monster. Congratulations to her. Is that shit brilliantly. He, 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 he said he was 160 on fight night. Yeah, he did it right. But Devin Haney does the same thing. Devin yeah, Haney is a weight bully. So Devin Haney was probably 160 as well. I loved it, man. Oh, like, it was amazing. I, 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 I loved it. Ryan is, is he the face of boxing now? Yeah. Easily. It's not even close, right? He's by far the most entertaining character in boxing. It's not yeah. even close. Like, the guy lit the internet on fire. Is that what it is? Is that where it is? Is that where it's at? To where Ryan Garcia has officially ascended to the throne of the most recognizable fighter in the sport. The face of it who can transcend sport, mere sport, and enter into the mainstream. Has that happened? Well, I do see a lot of people that don't otherwise converse about boxing, conversing about boxing due to Ryan's victory last weekend. Boxing purists, hardcore boxing fans may not be comfortable with the idea that Ryan Garcia, who won't stand for ceremony, didn't get to this position through conventional means. Ryan Garcia was already a well-known and popular fighter, not because of anybody that he fought per se, but because of his social media following. So when he does fight someone, someone good, and he actually wins, the effect is thereby amplified. What's going on? Now, whether or not he's already there, he's already the face of boxing, still is subject to some debate because Canelo Alvarez will be fighting soon. What still is the face of boxing to a lot of people, we have to see what the numbers for Canelo Alvarez's next fight are versus the numbers for Ryan's fight and what those numbers were. What those numbers are. Because it's conceivable that since Canelo is fighting another Mexican national like himself on Cinco de Mayo weekend, those numbers might be very big. They might be very big too. As much as you see a push online from certain individuals to poo poo all over this fight the reality is the paying public is likely to get behind it and if you were a part of that paying public then you'd know this fight might do a million jalisco versus tijuana i think the people that spend money on boxing the actual customers understand that the potential this fight has of doing good numbers it's definitely there and if it does that does take away from the claim that Ryan, Ryan Garcia, has ascended to being the face of boxing at this time. It might still be Canelo Alvarez for a while longer, though because Ryan is so young, he's got time. Ryan is said to have banked approximately $50 million from the Devin Haney fight. And what you have to ask yourself is, if he made that much, how many pay-per-views did they sell? A million? Close to a million? For Ryan to have made that much, what they're talking about now is sitting down with Ryan in the coming weeks and potentially making a Jose Ramirez fight. Jose Ramirez, who was in action yesterday. A former unified champion. A former unified champion who to some looked like he's on the back nine yesterday. He's only 31 years old, and before yesterday, he hadn't fought in approximately a year's time. So at least in part, what we saw could have been ring rust. He's being identified as a beatable opponent for Ryan Garcia because Ryan's too fast and Ryan's too strong. That's what some people are saying. Irrespective of the outcome, between Jose Ramirez's cult following in the West Coast 
and Ryan Garcia's growing fan base, his growing buzz, they could do very good business with this thing at the gate, at the box office, and I said as much in my previous video. It would be an in-house affair between Golden Boy Promotions fighters. I think Jose would go for it. His manager, Rick Merrigan. I mean, Devin Haney was said to have banked $35 million from this fight. Those are the kind of numbers that I think Jose and Rick would be looking for. They'd have to acquiesce to being the B-side in negotiations, but being the B-side to Ryan seems to be quite lucrative. So they might do it. They might bite, but will Ryan Garcia, in spite of his growing buzz, he's still a limited fighter. I still view him as a limited fighter. And last week's big win over Devin, it doesn't fool me. You guys had to play with the scales and get creative. You had to pull a fast one on Devin to secure that W. And good on you that you did it. As toxic and unstable as Ryan's relationship with Golden Boy has been in previous years, it would seem it's starting to pay off. It's finally starting to pay off. Though now that they're finally getting a return on that investment and all of the headaches that come with it, they have to be very careful how they match him because he still is a limited fighter. He may be your golden goose. He may be very popular and he may have more crossover appeal than most other young boxers. But what he doesn't have is their ceiling, their skill set. He's fast and he's strong but he's limited. So you have to be careful. A Jose Ramirez fight has all the right ingredients for Ryan and what Ryan's limitations are because Jose Ramirez looked pretty bad yesterday. Hurt several times by a 38-year-old Rancis Bartholomew who had not fought in close to a year. I understand that Jose hadn't fought in a long while too. I understand that he may have had ring rust to shake off, but irrespective of that, when's the last time Jose looked dynamic? When's the last time Jose looked good? When? When's the last time he looked the way that he looked opposite the ring, mighty Mo Hooker? When? The amount of times he walked into that straight left hand from Francis Bartholomew yesterday and was stopped in his tracks, hurt by it, visibly rattled. It paints a picture to where Ryan has the height, the length, the speed, and the power to walk him into his left hand, walk him into a left hook. What is Ryan's money punch? Jose Ramirez has never been a defensive wizard. He's there to be hit when he's closing the distance on the way in, and when he's in there, he squares up on his opponent, gives him both shoulders while he's trying to string punches together. For 38-year-old Francis Bartholomew, who used to campaign as a lightweight, if he can hurt today's Jose Ramirez, then so can Ryan. They might make this fight. And if they do, it'll sell. Just in keeping with the theme of all things Golden Boy, Golden Boy president Eric Gomez says Golden Boy has been in talks for a show against top rank. What, like Matchroom versus Queensbury? The boxing world has been put on notice by the 5 versus 5 card that will see 5 Matchroom boxing fighters versus Queensbury Promotions fighters on June 1st in Saudi Arabia. Turkey Al Sheikh challenged promoters Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing and Frank Warren of Queensbury to pit fighters against each other from their respective rosters. And the idea has gone over well with the fans. The card will feature high profile fights Fight, such fights, as Deontay Tay Wilder versus Zile Zhang and Raymond Ford versus Nick Ball. In some cases, these are good fights that weren't being made because of the political lines that were not being crossed. Or in reality, the money wasn't there for two promoters to work together. In a recent conversation with Golden Boy President Eric Gomez, the idea of such a concept using the Golden Boy roster is a very real possibility. We are open to do that with anybody, Gomez told Boxing Scene, but Gomez added that Golden Boy had already come close to making it happen already this year. We were approached earlier this year from Top Rank and Bob Arum, and he wanted to get something together, explain Gomez. I will say that Golden Boy versus Top Rank doesn't have the same backstory or buildup as Matchroom versus Queensbury. That's been a conversation in the UK for a very long time. There has been a grassroots demand to see those domestic rivals, those two promotional giants in the UK come together to do a show like that. People were asking for that. Whereas with this, I don't know that there's a grassroots demand to see top ranks fighters against Golden Boys fighters. No, I'd say there's more of a demand to see them versus the PBC. In a general sense, Top Rank versus PBC is more of a rivalry in America than Top Rank versus Golden Boy. They've already made several fights with each other 
over the years. Lomachenko versus Linares years ago. Rocha versus Santillian years later. The more recent female bout between Sinicia Estrada and Yo Costa Valle. All of those fights were top rank fighters versus golden boy fighters. Top rank usually gets the better end of it. Usually. The idea of seeing fights like Teofimo Lopez versus Ryan Garcia and Shakur Stevenson versus William Zapata would get most fans excited. To hear it has been thought about adds hope. I think in the near future, you will see something very likely with any of the big promoters, Gomez said. Though Saudi-backed investment in boxing has been complicated, one thing is clear. It is forcing interesting matchups to be made because money talks. Fights that used to stall are now being made, and the possibility of another promoter versus another promoter series of fights in the future is good for the sport. I'm not against it. If they want to do it, they can do it. Though... I think it would be difficult to get those bigger names on board, like a Shakur Stevenson versus William Zapata, like a Teofimo versus Ryan Garcia. I think those would be difficult fights to negotiate. Difficult fights to make. I think the level at which the tournament could be made is, say, Bektamir Melikuziev of Golden Boy against Christian Mabili of Top Rank. They could do that. Oscar Duarte of Golden Boy Promotions versus Sandor Martin of Top Rank. For those not aware, Top Rank signed Sandor some months ago. Right. Say Golden Boy Promotions offers a Jessica Niri Plata, a multi-fight deal. Jessica Niri Plata, unified like flyweight champion. Say they bring her in as a ringer. Or Evelyn Bermudez, the only other unified champion at that weight. Say they bring in either one of them as a ringer to represent them against Top Rank's own Senecia Estrada, who's likely moving up in weight in her next fight. And you see what I mean, that some of these fights are more doable than others, given the fighters' financial demands and the state at the weight, what prize stallions do they have there, what can they pursue, what are their chances of victory, things like that. Because even though it's the same concept, as Matchroom versus Queensbury, the grassroots demand for top rank to do a tournament against Golden Boy, well, that's what's not there. That's not something the fans were necessarily asking for, but it's not a bad idea, and I'm not against it. The marketability of the show all depends on what fights we're talking about and whether or not those fights can be made. Some of them are really good. The other question is, who's going to pay for it? The financial backing, because we know who's backing the Matchroom versus Queensbury tournament. We know who's paying for that. Would His Excellency pay for this? The reason that you can get so many familiar faces and so many familiar fighters that would otherwise be headlining their own shows or just something to that effect, all on the same show, is because His Excellency is making it possible. To make this possible, they might need his help. Why so many fighters are willing to take on so many risky fights? It's because they're making buku dollars to do it. So to get top ranks guys to fight golden boys guys, you might need buku dollars to do that. You might. Is that something His Excellency is interested in doing? Because don't forget, He's the reason that all of that with Matchroom in Queensbury is possible. It didn't happen on its own. Or can they make that tournament amongst themselves? We'll see.